Grace and peace be with you this day, and welcome to this moment of worship here in the sanctuary at the American International Church in London. Whether you're joining us from elsewhere in London or around the world, we are glad that you can be with us this day, joining in all of those who are here in the sanctuary in the pews as one community of faith, one world together before God this day, this Creation Sunday. In that spirit, would you join in this call? Come and celebrate our common home, for we gather with the family of humanity. With the mountains, islands, and deserts, we honor the glory of God in creation. With the lakes, rivers, and seas, we come to the source of living water. With the land, its soil, seeds, and sustenance, we give thanks for God's provision. With the forests of great trees, the lungs of the planet, we will sing joy and clap our hands. We join with the whole of creation, inspired by those who have gone before and the prophetic voices of today. We dare to praise and pray for another possible world to the glory of God. Amen. <laughs> to bold and urgent action. And we call ourselves to personal and collective action as well. And we call on the divine light to sustain and empower us.
great creator, the world before us is filled with beauty and life that is divinely inspired. Yet our abuse and misuse of this creation has led to a world where resources are scarce, droughts are commonplace, wildfires rage, and floodwaters rise. Forgive us for not caring deeply and radically enough, especially as that apathy enables destruction and dislocation among our most vulnerable communities and neighbors. As our world turns its focus on the leaders gathering for COP26 in Glasgow, may their hearts be generous, their commitments be, and their assurances more than just common effort. Now is the time for meaningful action to support your creation. May the unity brought by our shared humanity and shared planet surpass all that divides us. May our leaders recognize the final purpose of our special interest, and may we be moved to act in concert with the pledges made, and with you, the provider and sustainer of us all. Amen. And now, in that spirit of unity then, as you listen to this music, may the peace of God in this world wash over you this day. And would you, knowing that you are saved and forgiven, extend that peace on to others as well? Whether it's someone in the room next to you, someone far away via text or email, however it is that you can show the peace of God to one another this day. Peace be with you. Because of this, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. This is the word of the Lord.
and a word of prayer. God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, the cries of the world, be lifted up to you this day, be acceptable to you, and be heard. Amen. Now, as some of you have probably already seen or heard many times before, I developed a bit of a thing for houseplants over the past year and a half. It started with one small spider plant I bought for a fundraiser just before lockdown in March 2020. And eventually I was given a few more plants to brighten my space, and then I got hooked. I was propagating and subdividing, purchasing and gifting and receiving all sorts of houseplants. Just like what you see here on the altar, although I have to admit, none of these are mine. They are a gracious gift from a member of our congregation. But back with my own houseplants, towards the end of the summer, disaster hit. Despite my best intentions and due diligence, a few flying gnats made their way into my flat. And I ignored it for a bit, and applied simple fixes here and there, hoping they would just go away on their own. But when I returned from holiday, there was a full gnat infestation. It was not great. And it took another month of spraying, trapping, isolating, and triaging to get things under control. And by then, the damage was already done. And for that mother plant that I got last March, that was now huge, the damage was severe. And in order to save it, I had to go in hard, and leaves were pulled, roots were cut, soil replenished, tendrils torn off, and by the end, I assumed this plant, as it sat gloomily on the table, would not make it. But now, after an hour of intense cutting, and just two weeks of careful watering and waiting, the miraculous has started to happen. And five shoots of healthy green are rising from the remains of this old plant. You see, house plants, especially spider plants, are like this. They can be unbelievably resilient. Sure, there is an ideal to follow, but just about any amount of water or sunlight or humidity will do. Unfortunately though, as you've already heard today, not all of nature works this way. And for our world at a macro level, things might just be too late to save. In his latest book, David Attenborough ponders just this. Within the lifespan, of someone born today, he says, our species is currently predicted to take our planet through a series of one-way doors that bring irreversible change and commit us to losing the security and stability that this period, our Garden of Eden, has offered us. In such a future, Attenborough writes, we will bring about nothing less than the collapse of the living world the very thing that our civilization relies on. Our planet is not a house plant that will always bounce back, and certainly not in two weeks. And so instead, we are hurtling towards the collapse of the living world, and civilization as we know it. That's, that's a lot. But, you don't need me, or David Attenborough, or even the Bible to tell you that. We already know the world is being destroyed, and we already know that God calls us to care about creation around us. So instead of standing here and lecturing at you for another 10 minutes or so, I want to lift up a few snapshots from our congregation here on Top of Court Road as a way to get you thinking about where we stand and what can be done. Maybe this is a way to get you thinking about the prayer you want to put on your boat or the actions you want to do at home as well. 
looking to our littlest members and some of the earliest traditions of the church, I'm thinking about just earlier in the service when Jennifer recalled how the waters of baptism are those same waters that nourished the planet countless ages ago. But what if those baptism waters start to run dry? What happens when we break this cycle? And in their vows to their new babies, Kelly, Jan, Oliver, and Sophia promise to show love to their children so that they might in turn serve God's good creation. And as an entire community here, we accepted shared responsibility for baby Charlotte and Lucy's nurture and growth. But if these vows are to mean anything, that must also accept, that must also include accepting shared responsibility to properly nurture and steward the planet, which we will one day give to them as an inheritance. Really, these vows demand that we create an entire ecosystem that allows our children to grow as a part of the world around them, rather than alongside it or separate from it. It is a vow to nurture a world without end so that our faith and love and service can be without end as well. But what does a sustainable world actually look like? Another member of our congregation was asking these exact questions in a recent panel discussion. During it, they admitted that the reality of our deeply broken world means that sustainable living can mean completely different things if you live here in the UK, or in the US, or in the Philippines, or Kenya. And while we will all undoubtedly experience the effects of climate change and crisis, we already are, we know that the ways in which we will be affected will vary vastly based on our differences in culture and economies and geography. And so after discussing the conference, we wondered together, how can we as a church highlight these disparities and how can we work to change them? Similarly, what are we here in this sanctuary or in your living room if you're watching online or on this planet actually trying to sustain? Are we simply trying to find better ways of living as we currently do? Or are we preparing ourselves to make structural changes to safeguard everyone's future? In the same way we came together during the pandemic, how do we understand our individual responsibilities to each other and to future generations? And will we allow ourselves to let our company lives be slightly inconvenienced in order to create a baseline that all of humanity can reach and sustain? And to get us there, other members of the congregation are looking at our built environment to understand how our physical surroundings influence our choices and our lifestyles. That was the impetus behind bringing our altar with new plants. Sure, they help keep the air clean and just look nice, but they also send a signal that we value a living, slightly manicured space over a sterile, orderly one. Just like for me and my house plants at home, that I've cultivated over this past year, these plants here are a reminder that our spaces are most holy when they are alive. It is this focus on connecting the natural and the physical worlds that has led another member of the congregation to study sustainable building and workplace design, and yet another to attend COP26 in Glasgow as a representative of her firm's commitment to a greener and natural way of doing business. Okay, so now I hope we're all thinking, but what do we actually do besides making votes? Well, the first thing in this space is to recognize what we haven't always done right. 
In the scripture Scott read for us today, the prophet Hosea doesn't hold any punches. He says the Lord is bringing a charge against those who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, only lying and cursing and stealing. And because of this, Hosea says, the land dries up, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. Sure, this sounds, this is, was written 2,000 years ago, but it sounds a lot like today as well. And just when we want to start pointing fingers at big corporations or enough governments or whatever else, Hosea's message is to blame no one else but ourselves. We have stumbled day and night, he says, and the prophets stumble with us. And so here's the confession bit of things. Because fixing our world is going to require us all to admit what we have already done to destroy it. And here at the American International Church in London, we have failed the world God calls us to protect. Each year, we use over 8,000 liters of oil to heat our building with oil-filled boilers. We have a massive south-facing roof, but have yet to be able to invest in solar panels to green our energy supply. We go through enormous amounts of paper, plastic, and other disposable resources without a consistent recycling program. And surrounding our buildings our flat, and our flat roofs, we have a significant bed space where a diverse array of plants and animals could take hold. We could go on. Maybe you're thinking about the home places in your flat or your house. If only we had the vision, or the care, or the urgency, or frankly, the resources. Now, I don't want us to get stuck in our lack of action or our past misgivings. That is not the point of a Creation Sunday. And in his book, David Attenborough is keen to point out that it has only really been in the last few decades that we have truly realized that we have long been living inherently unsustainable lives. But now that we do know this, Attenborough says, we have a choice to make. We could carry on our living our happy lives, raising our families, busying ourselves with the honest pursuits of modern society that we have built, whilst choosing to disregard the disaster on our doorsteps. Or, at your rights, we could change. And if disaster is on our doorstep, so too is that change. And quite literally, with world leaders and change makers gathering in Glasgow tomorrow. But as Hosea says, the blame is all of ours to share. And so the change must be as well. Now, thankfully, David Attenborough and eminent scientists are still saying it is not too late for now. The message of the Bible, from the earliest days to the prophets to the life of Jesus, is that there is always room for repentance, forgiveness, and change. But like my houseplant in that gnat infestation, we have to go in hard, and fast, and really significantly change our lives and our society. The blueprints for doing so are already there. And I hope we can work together to discover what that means for us as individuals, as a church, and as a society. In fact, for our work as a church, there's already an organization called Eco Church, which could help us on our journey to become greener, more sustainable, and more aware. Complete with bronze, silver, and gold platinum accreditation schemes with recycled pews that they use to make awards. And for our world leaders and change makers gathering this week, they also know what it will take, but we must press upon them to not back down 
or rebrand empty promises as they gather in Glasgow. And as we'll hear in a moment when the choir sings the Jubilate, we ourselves in this space know a better way forward already, because the scriptures already declare it. Along the chastisement and repentance of the prophets is this glorious declaration that creating a world which resembles the kingdom of God involves nurturing our planet to be as it was in the beginning, now, and forevermore. A world without end, it declares. Amen.
to tell of your glory. The vastness of space and time proclaim that you are without end. Quarks and bosons reveal your care for the smallest detail. Mountains and seas, grasslands and forests teem with life, abundance, and beauty. It's a sign of your bounteous love. Thank you, God, for the earth and all that is in it. Forgive us our failure to care for this world and for one another as we ought. We repent both of the things we have done and the things we have left undone for all that has been lost already. We pray this day not only for your mercy, but for your transforming power. For those who are already hungry and displaced by climate change, for those whose health and well-being suffer from pollution, for those whose poverty makes them especially vulnerable. We pray, God, that that transforming power would not just work in the world, but work in us. We know our prayers and our repentance are only the beginning. Move us to act together with boldness to join in your work of salvation and care. Give us courage to face painful realities and faith that with you all is not lost. Strengthen us in hope of resurrection, that we might find light and joy even as we labor to sustain and we encourage others to join. God of all life, you loved this world so much you sent your son Jesus to live in it among us, to die for us, to be resurrected to save us. It's in that confidence and power of death and resurrection, your promise to heal and make all things new, that we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Once again, welcome to each and every one of you to this Sunday time of worship. It looks like the sun has broken out while we've been in here. We made a last minute call to hold off on tea and coffee unless the sun was shining, and it is. So I can see them setting up. There will be tea and coffee served outdoors, and we invite you to linger and visit one another out on the pavement with some biscuits as well. Next Sunday here in worship, we'll be ma marking All Saints Sunday and All Souls Day. This is a chance for us to remember those in our lives that we have loved and lost. You'll be invited at communion time to come forward again, as we've not done, although we will still be doing COVID safe protocols. And if you choose to light a candle and remember someone that you wish to honor. The cold weather shelter is ramping up again, and you can volunteer starting on the 5th of November. The format is different this year, and we'll be meeting volunteers just over the course of four weekends. You can be in touch with Jonathan for more on that. You'll also find in your bulletin news about children's programs and young adults, the St. Paul's Thanksgiving service, and how to sing with the choir as well as important conversations up and coming about marriage, gender, and sexuality in three places, in the Wednesday book group, in our Sunday morning Bible study on Zoom, and in a panel discussion after church on the 14th. Again, you can find all of those details in your bulletin or ask Jonathan or I after the service. All of this ministry 
is about repentance and forgiveness and living and making new. That means that we are called week in, week out to turn and return our lives to God. The act of making an offering is about turning back to God and offering to God what it is that we have to bring, returning to God all that we have been given. As we close in our hymn today, I invite you to consider making an offering in the plate at the back, to making a bank transfer, or making an offering of your heart and your time in the week ahead. Let us stand and sing. <coughs> Amen.